This is a VO's Padded Room Podcast with Big Jim and Brad Storm. Sit back, relax, and prepare to be entertained. Eh, pay no attention to that straitjacket. It's just for show. Trust me. This program contains crazy material, including offensive language. Listening discretion is advised. Our guest this week on a VO's Padded Room Podcast is a real-life energizer bunny. Not one to sit idle. Our guest is a painter, sculptor, furniture maker, amateur real estate investor, and voice actor. Of course, this working man has completed over 1,300 spots in his voiceover career and is represented by three highly reputable talent agencies. He's also traveled all around the United States, which has helped him tap into each and every scene that is put forth in front of him. He's the owner of Groove Promotions, where he spent five years in radio promotions while also jamming out with his band, Copperhead. Some of his recent works include World Series of Poker, Grizzly Industrial, Weber Grills, Kia Sorento, and Star Origins, to name a few. It's time to get strapped in the padded room as Dr. Jeff Williams gets locked in and mic up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Well, that's happening, brother. Man, it's it's. I'm happy to be here with you guys. Hey, Jeff, are you related to Doctor Death, Steve Williams, by any chance? You remember him? N- not that I'm aware of. The pro wrestler. N- not that I'm aware of, but I used to want to <laughs> be a pro wrestler. That was one of the things that I wanted to do. I never ended up doing. How come? Ah, uh, football, life, school, you know, all that. When I was, you know, I was, uh, I'm an 80s kid. Oh, of course. We are too. And uh, so it was Hulk Hogan and the Macho Man, right? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, step into a Slim Jim. <laughs> you know? That was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Me and Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you must have, did you sit in front of the TV on Saturday nights watching Saturday night main event by chance? 100%. Yeah. Hell yeah. WrestleMania was like the Super Bowl. Hell yeah, it was. I mean, the first one I saw it uh, at my grandma's house on HBO and I was like, what is this? I didn't know. Mr. T from uh, uh, A-Team is in this? What the heck? Yeah. So yeah, that th- those were oh, good I times. It was amazing. I got a couple of qu- quick questions too before... We go into, uh, we go back in time. Now, what do you like? Doctor, doctor, give me the news. Doctor Love, remember that song from uh, Kiss? Or Doctor Feel Good? Which song do you like the best? Uh, the first one. Was that Robert Palmer? Is that doctor, right? Doctor, doctor, give me the news. Yeah. What about movies? Doc Hollywood, Doctor Strange, or Doctor Doolittle? Uh, Doc Hollywood. Oh, I love Doc. They just played it the other day. Or uh, Doc Holiday. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, Doc Hollywood was a great movie. Are we talking about? Val Kilmer Tombstone? Um, Doc no, Doc Hollywood with uh, Michael J. Fox. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I got all... Remember where he goes to the farm town and because a doctor there? I got you. Let's go with uh, Eddie Murphy and Dr. Doolittle. There you go. There you Dr. go. Dr. Doolittle. I like that one, too, yeah. man. I like that one, too. But as far as characters, Doc Holliday, absolutely. Doc Holliday, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm the, I'm, 100%. I'm your Huckleberry. I'm your Huckleberry. Yeah, Val Tombstone was a great movie back in the day they don't make them like that i know i didn't mean to take that off the off the track for you guys so no, okay hey, whatever <laughs> are we ever on the track jim are we ever on the oh, track? oh no again this is just we're having a good old time right uh going back in time you're a you're a young boy let the show begin uh what did you do growing up uh did you get like did you pretend to have different voices for your toys uh what was the things that you like to do? Little, little bitty. Every, I was just thinking about this the other day. Right on. Little bitty. Every item in my room had like its own uh, personality almost like what they call it personification. You know, you see cartoons and yeah. and these little inanimate objects have some sort of personality. Yeah, that was me. I'm not sure that I had voices for them at all. Voiceover was, was you know, not part of my life, but uh, right. uh, definitely I, I lived in a little bitty fantasy world like that. And I'm also a uh, video game generation. You know, we were the first ones that had yep. Pong and then Atari and all that. So yeah, loved all of that stuff, playing Atari with my buddies and MTV. Watching. So you had Atari. You didn't have Intellivision or Coleco, huh? You know, my parents, they, they did not deprive us, but they also didn't spoil us with Intellivision where you actually could see legs moving and stuff. No, we were the... We were the block Atari 2600. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I got spoiled, I guess. I had the television. <laughs> 
those were the great days, man. And, you know, all these kids nowadays, they complain like, all these graphics, they suck. <laughs> oh, this <laughs> no. game sucks. I said, yeah, I haven't played a sucky game yeah, I know. Who, until you go back to the early 80s. Who has the best graphics? Is it Xbox or PlayStation? It's like, who gives a shit? They're both amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We used to go to the arcade because they, that was a place to go with the best graphics. And now these, you know, these kids nowadays, damn it. Oh, yeah. Always complaining about something. Dragon's Lair. Oh, yeah. Dragon's Lair. Space Age. Come on. Rampage. Exactly. Moon Patrol. It's amazing. Yeah, it was just, <laughs> you, you go to the mall, put a quarter in the arcade, and hopefully you didn't run out of money in two minutes. Those are the good old days. You did say we were going to go back to childhood, man. I, I, this is a good way to go back to childhood. This is good stuff. Yeah. Back then, video games were uh, were for a rainy day. Every other day, we were outside. We, yeah. That was the last thing on our you mind. You weren't afraid to go. It was video games. Yeah, and yeah. that's what I tell my kids. I tell my kids, man, there is always a time for video games. There's always a time for sitting around and watching anime or whatever it is you do. But primarily, you need to be out trying to get some exercise and living your life. Because that's what we did, man. We were out first thing in the morning, outside of school, by the way. But first thing in the morning, man, we were on the sidewalks. We were going, finding each other. We didn't have phones. Yeah. So we had to go hunt each other down on our bikes. And yeah. we wouldn't be home until the lights came on. And, <laughs> and then we would eat dinner. And then we would play video games. Yeah, I think uh, parents nowadays, they're just so uh, terrified uh, to let their kids go out on their own. Uh, it's, a dis it's a different world we live in. I mean, I remember riding my bike. I told my daughter who's seven. I told her, I said, yeah, I used to ride my bike everywhere. I used to ride it to the gas station, get my garbage pail kids and, uh, you know, ride my bike home. She's like, you went outside and rode your bike by yourself? I was like, hell yeah. Without supervision? We used to play kickball in the cul-de-sac. Yeah. Yeah, we used to play tackle football out in the backyard, you know, we had a basketball court. I think when we got our glass backboard, that was the best thing in the world. Absolutely. Uh, when you got the glass basketball court uh, backboard. You're an athlete, and uh, I'm sure you found out early on that you were pretty skilled in a couple of sports. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, well, um, so I'm from a small town called Perryton, Texas, almost Oklahoma, which is almost Kansas. Is that little strip of Oklahoma there. And uh, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Plus, I'm I was a big kid, so I'm I'm six four, about two eighty. I'm I'm a big dude. Yeah. And you don't grow up in a small town and uh, with my size and not participate in sports. It's just an absolute <laughs> has to happen. Yeah. And uh, so you know, and you play all sports, by the way. You don't specialize like the kids do these days. And uh, uh, so eventually, you find out what you're pretty good at. And I was okay at basketball, but I was really good at football, and I was really good at shot putting discus. So yeah. I dropped basketball, kind of focused on those two things, and was fortunate enough to go to school on a, a full scholarship. Went to uh, started out at West Texas State here in Canyon, Texas, and then uh, ended up transferring to Northwest Louisiana. But I signed an intent to play football before track season, and I had no idea. I was going to end up winning state in discus. Right. So right. I went on to win state that year, my senior year, but I'd already signed a football scholarship. So I went ahead and honored that and did football. But I, I, if I could go back, that's one of the things I would change. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't change a lot, but I would change that. I'd go back and throw discus instead. We talked about wrestling earlier. You didn't wrestle at all, huh? In high school? No. My school, we were so small, we didn't have a wrestling program. We didn't even have baseball until um, I think my junior year. Oh, wow. Wow. Baseball's pretty big, too. Yeah. Of course, I'm old. Like, uh, you know. They didn't have you doing soccer either, right? No soccer. No, <laughs> not in small town Texas, man. Mm -hmm. that was, it's all football, it's all basketball. Football. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's all football. Yeah. When did you start picking up a guitar? Well, so I'm going to blame my art career and my music on my dad. He was, he, he was a player. And it's, it's so interesting when you think of somebody making one simple decision and how that filters down through families. Yeah. To me, it's just fascinating. My dad was the only person in his family to ever go to college. Now, all of us have gone to college. He was the only one in his entire family, five kids, only one, uh, to start picking up an instrument and playing, which was the guitar. And he played in bands uh, all the way up until he had a stroke a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And and so that's kind of what got me moving in that direction. Uh, but now my kids can both play a little bit. Uh, my nephew, my brother, they all play the guitar. So just one decision by somebody that is influential in a family can really filter down for good and bad, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, so I started probably when I was 
16, I think. I was a junior in high school. Okay, yeah. And I'm, I'm a bit obsessive compulsive about things, so I really dove in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you're like practicing your scales like constantly. You're like, oh, yeah, I got to get these scales right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know how that feeling can be. Yeah. I, I play my acoustic guitar a lot nowadays oh, uh, yeah. just to calm my nerves. You know, uh, we talked about anxiety earlier. You got to find outlets to calm those anxieties. A uh, voiceover, getting to the booth is one of them, right? And then uh, playing guitar and exercise. Those are always good outlets to have. Exercise for sure. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was telling somebody in an interview just the other day that sculpting and painting uh, and, yeah. and just sitting there in your own noggin creating something and music as well. I told my kid, I said, guitar is one of those things where if you had a crap day, you can come home and play about it. Yeah. If you had an amazing day, you can come home and play about it. You know, just, and, and it is so therapeutic, mm -hmm. creating art, music, whatever. It's, it's so good for your brain. And music's also good for voiceover. Oh, yeah. Um, because in music, you learn tempos, you learn cadence, you learn volume and all that kind of stuff, singing. And it always translates well, but you wouldn't realize that until later on. Uh, but before that, I mean, you got out of college to, and then you started studying uh, to be a chiropractor, right? Ah, uh, man, I knew I wanted to be a chiropractor from the time I was a freshman in high school. I, I had a skiing accident, landed on top of my head, mm. and my neck was just killing me for months. Like I said, I was, I was uh, athletic, and the medical doctor didn't help. The, we went to an osteopath. He didn't help. And finally, after so long, my mom was like, you ought to try this chiropractor. And I was like, I don't know what the hell that is, but let's give it a shot, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, I had suffered for months and literally in two weeks, he had me out of pain. Like, you'd never known anything was wrong. And I still don't have any issues. So I thought, man, that's powerful. And so um, uh, I just, kn I knew right then that's what I wanted to do. I wasn't a blood and guts guy. Yeah. I wanted to help people and, and that made sense to me. So. Uh, I think I start. I graduated January '98, so I believe I did too. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. December '98. Yeah, you got to go to four years of undergrad and then three years of chiropractic school. So, um, you know, I that's about roughly when I started my journey. What was the most difficult patient you had ever had to deal with? Ooh. As a chiropractor. Man, you're talking 24 years of patience. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. I've had all kinds of stuff happen. We, I mean, I've seen grown men crying. I've seen, um, I've seen bowel and bladder dysfunction mm -hmm. because of uh, nerve issues, you know, blown out discs and stuff. I, I've, Three weeks ago, I had, um, what is that? sacrum area where the tilt sacroiliac yeah yeah i had a, the nerve pinched in between that took me off for about three weeks i'm still you know i'm still recovering from it but geez yeah i can find you somebody good down there if you don't have one oh absolutely saying. but anywho <laughs> i've i've seen them i've seen them come in from car wrecks just beat all the hell staples all across their heads um and and i i had one that was in a car wreck and she was coming back to just meet me and greet me. And, and we were going to do an exam. I hadn't even touched her. And she passed out right in the hallway. And we had to call the ambulance wow. to come and get her. Yeah. And I'm like, this ambulance in front of my office is not a good uh, visual. <laughs> come on, come yeah. on. No, <laughs> this, uh, uh, nope. this needs <laughs> yeah. to stop. Uh, what about the skeptics? You know, people are like, oh, you got, once you go to a chiropractor, you got to continually go. You can never stop. Is there any truth to that? No, absolutely not. Uh, anytime you hear somebody really bagging on chiropractors, they've either been to a horrible one yeah. or they're just kind of ignorant of research and all that good stuff. So yeah. just to kind of give you a little, I'm, I'm not like a lot of chiropractors. I'm probably a little bit different than most of them. 2% uh, get a fellowship training and I have, or I have two fellowships. And so I've got a fellowship in orthopedics and one in medical, legal, forensics, uh, expert witness type uh, work. And so, you know, I come from a very research-based, evidence-based background. And so everything I do is well-established. And there's a mountain of research behind spinal manipulative therapy, exercise, function, strengthening, yeah. pain science. I lecture on chronic pain to other chiropractors and teach them. And I have a podcast of my own called Chiropractic Forward, where mm. we talk about research papers relevant to the industry and all that. So 
when people say it's, it's hooey and all that, they probably <laughs> went to one of those more vitalistic chiropractors that said, I'm going to pop your back and I'm going to fix your allergies and your asthma and maybe your cancer and your earaches, you know, that is not substantiated in the research. For example, the VA sends veterans to chiropractors and acupuncturists and massage therapists because the research is so good and the government will cover that for veterans. It needs to filter out to the rest of the population that, hey, um, what happens when physical therapy fails for people, right? They go straight to pain management or they go to surgery. But there's a gap there where a good evidence-based chiropractor could really keep some people from having surgeries. That's my spiel. What do you think about yoga? Oh, I love yoga. Yeah, I do too. So it really does kind of depend the type of yoga. If somebody has real chronic issues with their low back or uh, especially a disc issue, you can bend a disc in the wrong way because a disc is kind of like a bag of water. If you push one side down, the other side bulks up. Yeah. If you've got a disc injury towards the back and you're bending forward in yoga, you're pushing the bulk of it back towards the nerves. So you actually could do more damage that way. But under normal circumstances, yoga is excellent. And American College of Physicians recommends yoga for a back pain. Do I sound like I know what I'm talking about? I no, I think you promise. do. I think you do know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're a perpetual learner. And that's what I like about yeah. you because you're always wanting to be better than you were the previous day. And uh, why don't you touch real quick before we get into this game show, why don't you touch on uh, your um, involvement with radio promotions, with Groove Promotions? How did that all come about? Well, everything that I've done kind of is a transition from what was there previously, what I was already doing. So I went on the road. I was a singer-songwriter with a band called Copperhead. Um, and we got an album on iTunes called Remedy, if anybody wants to go check it out. Uh, there's more than one copperhead, by the way. So you got to look for the album remedy. But yeah, we didn't know that back then. <laughs> so uh, we toured around all over Texas for about eight years. And then once that was done, I had all of these radio connections and going out and doing interviews and stuff like that when we're in town. And I thought, well, why not parlay that into a record promotion company? So I started Groove Promotions. So my band was Copperhead, not Turnpike Troubadours, but where you got the Turnpike Troubadours was is that they are a huge band now, like super popular. Okay. And I was their very first radio promoter. So more of the Texas market guys would be like Band of Heathens that we promoted and uh, the Great Divide is a big red dirt, you know, Mike McClure. That So a lot of the guys that maybe they're not recognized nationally, but in the Texas market and the red dirt market. They're huge. So I got to do that for, for quite a while. Outlaw country is your, is your scene for sure. Huh? Oh, man. I love Texas country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's my deal for sure. You traveled around the United States. You played. You had a good time. What's the most memorable story you had on the road? You're asking me big questions. <laughs> uh, hey, I used to go on the road with wrestling. Yeah. So I knew all about the road. Man, so many uh, really, really neat memories. Uh, Gary P. Nunn is, again, a, a Texas legend, and I got to sit with him in a hotel in San Angelo uh, until about four or five in the morning, just swapping my guitar back and forth, singing songs to each other. I uh, met uh, Billy Joe Shaver and played with him. I've played with so many really influential and neat people. I've sung with Pat Green. It may not mean anything nationally, but in this market, it means a lot. We got to play at Green Hall down in, in uh, uh, Green, Texas, right outside of New Braunfels, which is the oldest dance hall in Texas, so a very prestigious place to play. And probably the coolest concert, we played out in Scottsdale, Arizona, at an opera house called the Carefree Opera House. And we opened up for uh, Shooter Jennings, which is Waylon Jennings' son. And right before him was Jesse Coulter, which was Waylon Jennings' wife. And she was kind of big back then, you yeah. know, as well. So country music, television, and all those people were all out there. It was amazing. Yeah, that's great to hear. Because guess what? It's about that time. Oh, no. Let the games begin! Let the games begin! Let the games begin. We know what that sound means. That's right, it's time for another round of Avio's Padded Improv. Today we have a script for you from the YouTube famous Brooke and Jeffrey Show. So when you're ready, 
The mic is yours. All right. Outfit is banging. I got my fangs in. I take the ketchup. Fake a laceration. I see many girls in their twins. They wear nothing but some cat ears and panties. Every mummy here looking for a soulmate. Seen Beetlejuice dancing on a mermaid. Ay, ay, ay. We scary on Halloween with a punch spike. Got the vampire babes. <laughs> this is amazing script here. Yeah. With the fishnet legs, trying to suck face. Pennywise, two, two ghosts. One sheet in the bedroom. Crazy like Joker with the green dome. Sip, sip, sipping on a keg cup full of Keystone. Got seven Harley Quinns here and they're bound to start a fight. That's how we do, how we do. Scary like boo, scary like boo, scary like boo. It's a full moon. Beautiful, beautiful, perfect. <laughs> that was good. I liked it. It made me laugh. Good. It was great. That was, that was and, good. Uh, I'm glad you're a good, uh, uh, a, a great participant in what we do. Yeah. Hunter Hayes would be proud. <laughs> kind of loosens everybody up. Usually the second half, they're like, oh, there yeah. you go. <laughs> I like it. Kind of like after a chiropractic visit, right? That's right. <laughs> as long as you don't fart on the on the chiropractor, that's oh, all yeah. that matters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, has that happened? <laughs> man, it happens all the time. Yeah. What do they shart? Do they shart by chance? I I believe I've had one over the years, oh. but usually it's just a, a little popcorn. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and it's usually the females, by the way. They're like, oh my. Oh uh, yeah, no. yeah. They're so embarrassed. And they're like, oh, oh, oh. sorry, <laughs> sorry. Oh, it smells like roast beef in here. Hey, it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> if we act like it didn't happen, it didn't happen. So let's just act like it didn't happen. It's a barking spider over there. <laughs> so have you ever, okay, this is another, have you had, have you ever had a patient try to come on to you um, during those years? Like, you know, like in the, in the, on the table or something? N no, not on the table, just being um, overly flirtatious in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. But y luckily, I mean, my wife and I, we went to preschool together. Oh, that's awesome. We went to high school together. Yeah, we've been together. Yeah, I'm not saying you acted on it. I was just, you know. No, no, it, of it course not. And stuff. Well, the, what I was going to say is we've been married 30 years, and everybody that comes in, it's, I mean, you know, my wife works up there a lot, and yeah, so. I think even if somebody wanted to, they wouldn't mm -hmm. just because. <laughs> You'd hear in the background, oh, hell no. Right. <laughs> and besides that, I'm, I'm not very pretty. Oh, you are sexy so. as hell, brother. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> He's blushing now, bro. Holy there. I am oh, a little okay. bit. <laughs> Hello. Hey, uh, you've reinvented yourself on numerous occasions, you know, and... Uh, the world we live in, it's very fast paced. You got to learn. You got to be a constant learner, like we talked about earlier. And in voiceover, it's like you got to be up on trends and you got to be able to adapt and kind of reinvent yourself. Uh, what's the key to that as far as you're concerned and with your journey? Well, like you said, a, a thirst to learn. Like when I decide I'm going to do something, whether it's uh, like when I decided I wanted to be a sculptor, I got the books. I started uh, searching everything I could on YouTube. I went to upstate New York, this small town Texas kid, went to mm -hmm. upstate New York and took classes. And I mean, I really dive in and I did the same thing with voiceover. I said, you know, um, what separates people are those who say, you know, I want to do that. That kind of sounds like a cool idea. That sounds fun. Mm -hmm. But they never get any equipment. They never take a first right. step. And then you've got the people that say, I am doing this. This is going to happen. And I'm going to do it at the highest level I can do it. I'll never be the best because you can't. No. But I can be the best that I can be. And if, if, if people get booked more than I do, that's great. Right. Good for them. But it's not going to be lack of effort on my part. And that's for damn sure. So I just dove in, man. I got the books. I got the podcasts. I, you know, I uh, started joining Facebook groups and, and uh, just really immersed myself. And I tried to lose the fear of failure. Yeah. You know, you don't, people are afraid to fail. They, yeah. And they're afraid to look stupid. Yep. Yep. That's true. Yeah. So I didn't want to be riding the bench. I wanted yeah. to be in the game. And you got, um, and you started in the game in 2000, correct? About the pandemic and everything. You, yeah. You had a friend? Yeah. You, if you can, I mean, you can, a lot of people don't want to go to the clinic uh, when 
there's a pandemic going on. Yeah, it's something yeah. that you just. Yeah. Yeah. You got to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had to close down completely for two weeks. And then there was only emergency Ooh. patients that would have gone to an emergency room, you know, on top of that. And there's just not a whole ton of those. 30 years ago, I met a drummer in college in Louisiana and his name was Andy Field. And now he is the voice of hand unit for the Five Nights at Freddy's series. Okay, okay. He's got like almost 100,000 yeah. followers on, on TikTok. And all. he is kid famous. So <laughs> I remember over the year or two prior to yeah. the pandemic, he had started posting about voiceover and Five Nights at Freddy's. And he did a Nike commercial and all this stuff. And so I got to thinking, well, you know, I'm 50. I just turned 50, man. Um, if I wanted to start moving towards having more time out of the clinic, how would I replace that income doing something that really is I'm interested in and sounds amazing? And so I just started picking his brain. He said, man, you know, I run a course called uh, The Business of VoiceOver is what it was called. And it was 16 weeks, an hour and a half every Tuesday night. I was like, all right, let's do it. And so he really got me started and got me a good head start. In fact, now he and I are both creating an online version called Square One VO. So for people who are starting at Square One, okay. can take our online course. It's not ready yet, but it, but it will be eventually. But uh, we're just taking that course that got me a head start, and we're putting it online with with my input as well. So. Outstanding. And if you like, if you uh, if you need some you know, assistance or whatever from Brad or I, you know, Adobe Audition or anything, a beginner's, you know, courses and stuff. Uh, oh, that'd be amazing. Let us know. Reach out, man. We have no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm a Twisted Wave guy. So <laughs> Adobe oh, okay. Audition right is on. like. Right on. Yeah. I feel like uh, the importance in trying to get over the hump and if, as a voiceover artist, you have to go train with the best whether it be in audio engineering, whether it be in uh, acting. And you've trained now with some of the best. I have. You yeah. trained with Tim Tippett. You trained with Mark Cashman. Yep. Kelly McGee, Chris McCain. I mean, talk about these people and how they influenced you and helped you grow. Yeah, I was going to preface that, Brad, with kind of make sure it's in your genre or your wheelhouse that you're wanting to do. You know? Oh, yeah. I would say don't go to an animation expert if you're wanting to learn, you know, whatever this other side of things, the commercial side yeah. of the voiceover, you know, because you're not going to get the most benefit out of that. Yeah. I think. No, 100%. And I used to be in a, a chiropractic mastermind group down in Dallas where a lot of um, leaders and, and big thinkers would meet up and we'd solve each other's problems. And after about a year, one guy dropped out and I was like, you know, hey, why did you drop out? And he said, you know, what I, what I realized is that after a while, you kind of learn everything you're going to learn from one person. So, you know, they were moving on to something else. And I thought, man, so I, I've really tried to hold on to that and get as many different inputs as I can. And, right. and fortunately, because of uh, being a chiropractor, I'm, I have the benefit of, of being able to reach out and afford some of these guys and, and, and really get some good direction. And I know not everybody can do that. That's, you know, coaching is a challenge for some folks. Uh, I would say Kelly McGee, uh, she's amazing. She's in New York City, and she was really helped me get started at you know twenty five, thirty dollars an hour coaching, and that's a real deal that just about anybody yeah. can can save up. And so if anybody wants to reach out to me for her contact info, I'll be happy to interact with you on Facebook or or whatever. Uh, my email is jeffwilliamsvo at gmail dot com. So just reach out to me; I'll get you all that. Uh, Chris McCann did my first demo. Holy. I can't even tell you how uh, it, it would be inappropriate to tell you how much money that demo has made me. But I mean, at 1,300, 1,500 projects in the past couple of years, you can only imagine. And that all came from Chris McCann. Uh, he's out in Birmingham. And then, uh, yeah, Mark Cashman gave me a good head start. Tim Tippett's got my studio all dialed in and Tim and I are friends still. Uh, and then uh, I've been coaching with J. Michael's, uh, J. Michael Collins here, uh, JMC. Nice. And, nice. Uh, and he is just such an incredible guy. I mean, you know, with his influence and stature, he could be a turd if he wanted to, you know, <laughs> if, if we're just being honest. Right, right. And he right. is anything but. He is just genuine and nice and 
uh, helpful and encouraging and responsive and just uh, uh, just a, a gem of a human. I can't say enough about him. He keeps his humility. That's awesome. Hundred percent. Very humble. That's that's good. I respect that. I was at a voiceover conference this past weekend, and uh, it was online. It was on Zoom. Vio's Journey Conference. Yeah, I was. I'm rewatching that right now. Yeah, yeah. And there was a lot of great speakers in that conference. But I think a lot of uh, the 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 repetition of the same things to succeed is to train with coaches uh, that have already made it. You got to train with the coaches that have doing what you want to be doing, like we just talked about. Oh, yeah. I don't think, I mean, you can do it the other way where you're learning through YouTube or trying to learn through uh, other friends that are going, it's just going to take longer. It's going to take a lot longer. Yep. And you're not like networking. You had a friend that, are, that you met a, a while ago playing guitar and now he's doing Five Night at Freddy's. So networking is important. You cannot stop reaching out to contacts because you never know where they're going to be. Plus, trends change constantly. So you want the working voice actor coaches that are, you know, have spot, have done spots for those changing trends, you know, for sure. Yeah. I went down to the, uh, the One Voice conference in Dallas back this summer. And, mm -hmm. and just networking, meeting people, I met more. So Andy Field was at that as well. And boy, he introduced me to everybody and we went to the socials and we, you know, it was very, very valuable. And I know that from my, my healthcare provider career, we go to conferences. I'm, I've been in the, um, the Texas Chiropractic Association leadership of our entire state. And I know what that did for me on that end of it. And so when it came to voiceover, I was like, conferences? Yeah. Yeah. Count me in. I'll be there and I'll be at the bar talk drinking but also talking to people <laughs> and uh you know buying them drinks asking hey what's working for you and all that stuff what i learned too through this conference this past weekend not just to go to voiceover conferences go to video production conferences go to like audio production conferences go to these different conferences that are looking for voice artists and uh i was like man that's it should be uh, right in front of my face, but I didn't really see that. You know, it just didn't, it wasn't there. And, uh, and that's why we go to these conferences to learn about these things. So, yeah. And I'll tell you another little tip that uh, I started that has been helpful getting me on rosters. I have a, you know, I've got a full time job and I know to build a voice career, you've got to be marketing. It's not right. how good you are, it's how good you market. And that's the base bottom line. And so I don't have time. I mean, I'm seeing 45 to 50 patients a day. When am I going to sit and send out a bunch of emails? So I use a lot of virtual assistants for the, my websites and chiropractic side of stuff. And, and so I just decided to can, continue that into this end of it and have a virtual assistant that, that helps do reach out to production companies and marketing agencies and things of that nature and get you on some, some rosters that what a I would have never gotten on. You know, I've always thought about, I have some connections in the virtual assistant world too. And I, you know, I'm just like, oh man, I don't know how much they're going to cost me. Yeah. But uh, in the long run though, that might make sense. About 80 bucks a week. Yeah. I mean, well, that might make sense. That, 50 to 80. I mean, you just, you know what though? You set your own. That, that right there, if, so, if they're sending out all the emails and reaching out to all the people, that gives you more time to focus on, you know, your acting, you, you know, whatever else you need to do. Yeah. So that would pay dividends. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely, it does. You just got to pull the trigger. You know, some things you, you get to a point where you get so like, okay, I've, only, I've gone as far as I can go. Now I got to pull the trigger and do something else uh, in the voiceover realm. I'm going to give you a book recommendation. Okay. You ready? I can't remember the name of the author, but it's called Who Not How. Who Not How. Yeah. So when you're thinking, how am I going to get all this marketing out? How am I going to have time to do all of this? How is the wrong question. The right question is who? Who do I know that can yeah. help me do this? Who do I know that I can invest in that I'll get a return on that investment? That's a really good way to put it. I mean, really. There is. you go. Because <laughs> um, I told my wife, I said, I'm, I'm reconnecting with my chamber. I'm going to get back out there in the local community because, you know what? You know, when you build the relationships with your community, I mean, you can, it's, I think that's better working for people locally than it is on a Fiverr or Upwork where, yeah. you know, you can't even talk to half of those people most of the time, right. unless you're doing a message. Sure. Um, 
This has been a great show, Jeff. Real quick on the on on the book, is it a big yellow book uh, with blue? Do you have it pulled up? I do. Um, it looks like Dan Sullivan is the author. Yep, that's it for people out there. Yeah, that's it. Anyway, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, it's been a great show, Jeff. I mean, I think we went over a little bit, but hey, when the show is good, we got to keep rolling, right? It goes quick too. The time goes by fast. It really did. Any final thoughts you want to put out there to the uh, VO community? Uh, keep an eye out for Square One v- uh, VO in probably the winter. I've got a really cool uh, fighting video game, my first Xbox PlayStation game called uh, God of Rock by Modus Studios. So cool. I'm the Elvis char- well Elvis E character coming out. Well, let me tell you, you know, that's, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And just, Sweet. um, you know, if you're thinking about doing it, stop thinking anything whether it's voiceover or whether it's getting better exercise basket weaving yeah just just do it just get going i think yoda said that being sedentary being stationary in life is not an option you're either going forward or you're going backward so we need to get moving yeah that's true you want to plug your social media accounts uh go for it yeah, I got uh, JeffWilliamsVoice.com, and I've got Jeff Williams Voice on Facebook, Jeff Williams Voice on the Instagram. I think I'm on Twitter as well. So, yeah, JeffWilliamsVoice.com. Go check it out. Big Jim, got any final thoughts? Uh, you reach out to me on BigJimMedia.com is my website. Facebook at Big Jim Media. Uh, YouTube, I believe, is Christopher Big Jim Lamance, I think. I may have to change that to just Big Jim to make it easier. But, uh, yeah, that's about it. Uh, how about you, Brad? Yeah, it's going to be Brad Storm VO on Twitter, Instagram, um, TikTok, and Brad Storm on YouTube, Brad Storm voiceover on Facebook, and Brad Storm Lanou on LinkedIn. And guess what? A VO's Padded Room podcast is on YouTube as well. So subscribe, like, and share with the world. Well, I dropped, no, I just threw a fucking blank. Sorry. <laughs> and when the day gets long and shit gets real, you gotta punch every day. In the face! Yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys have too much fun. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's show. 